So we're on apostolicity, which is a very important topic, obviously, in, you know, in the present context of things. So, uh, number 20.5, we just said that there has to be a legitimate public and never interrupted succession of pastors. 20.5 is that it must be legitimate, that is, there must be a formal succession, not merely material. All authors uh, admit material succession. Uh, everybody does. They, re the, it, it, they usually say it concerning the Greek Orthodox uh, who have uh, continued to succeed in sees that one person succeeds another. They haven't uh, interrupted the line of bishops in those sees. All right. uh, everyone says that's material succession. All right. uh, and that there's, they're valid. Uh, formal succession is that which happens according to the precepts of Christ. Material succession is that which consists in the mere occupation of a pastoral see without heed to, precept, to the precepts of Christ. So the, it means that you have pure succession. And uh, so you can have um, uh, legitimate or illegitimate the, all the authors would say the Greek Orthodox is illegitimate. Illegitimate. Uh, because it's not, it doesn't, they, they are cut off from the Roman pontiff. But there is a succession. It's an illegitimate material succession. All the authors will say that. Uh, the, who speak about it. Uh, the, uh, we're saying, uh, at least the, the thesis is saying, that there is a legitimate material succession with regard to the Novus Ordos because there has been no break from the body of the church, as in the case of the schismatics. That's the theory. But whatever theory you come up with, You've got to include that legitimate succession. And some might say, well, how do you have a legitimate succession when they're all heretics? Uh, the, uh, the power of, I would do this, first of all, the power of designation is not the power to rule. You have, if you are a citizen of the United States or of your own country, you have the power to designate officials, but you have no power to rule. Those two things are really distinct. So the, there is a, there, you're not, you don't need power to rule jurisdiction in order to have legitimate ex succession. That's the point. What you need is power of designation. And the the explanation goes this way, that because they have not abandoned designating, the, in other words, the end uh, of designation, as they keep the, the designation going, they have not lost, therefore, the power to designate. So that's, there's a legitimate nomination. That's, that's the explanation. As I said, if you can come up with something better, let's hear it. But you need to preserve that. That's the key. You need to preserve legitimate succession. Otherwise, if you say that both lines, both the formal line, which is the doctrine and everything, sacraments, everything spiritual, you might say, if the formal line is, is cut off and the material line is finished, you have no more church. That's your theological problem. So 
in other words, before you, you criticize the thesis of Gerard de Laurier, you come up with a better one. <laughs> Don't say, you know, you come up with something that, that, says, that explains all that. And the only thing I have ever heard from people who deny legitimate succession is that there's going to be an apparition of St. Peter telling somebody who's the Pope, uh, or there's going to be the end of the world, or there's uh, the, you know, Christ will appear in the skies and uh, designate a Pope, or there'll be a conclave of traditional bishops. Th those are the only things I've ever heard. Yes. Well, this one is not participating, I'll tell you that. The, 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 uh, and really, the fact that they're bishops doesn't give them any more power to designate than priests or even lay people. They, they have no power to designate because they're bishops. That They only have a power of orders. But they, you know, I exceed the priest only by power of orders. I do not exceed any priest by power of jurisdiction. See, so it doesn't, you know, have a conclave of bishops. You know, it's ridiculous. They don't have any power. So those are the only things I've ever heard. All right, and so you know, I, I think that uh, the, the you need to press. You know, if. If you, if you, you know, even press your own, because uh, I, I, as I said, I don't want to impose this on anybody, but come up with a better solution, and everybody's listening. But you have to preserve certain things, certain qualities of the church that are necessary for the church. And I would also say, as a confirmator of the of the model that we have is that um, that you don't require, no one requires the lifting of the excommunication when you come back from the Novus Ordo. Nobody does. Which means that there is no legal breach. There is no bodily breach between Novus Ordo and well, let's call it traditional Catholic. There is, there is none. It's the same body. Okay, so, and that's a, that would be a confirmatur of what we're saying, is that you, you have, in other words, that you have continuity, the material continuity, but you don't have formal continuity in the Novus Ordo. And, the, and that's the problem. If they would do us a big favor and just split <laughs> and say, we, we are a new church, and a uh, new religion, and we, uh, you know, we have nothing to do with the, the church of pre-Vatican II. That would just clear up everything. The very problem is the material continuity. And that's why people don't see this problem, which is far more important. In other words, they, they see a, you know, a continuity of the organization, and you know, things are going along. It's like the, we're on the same train. You know, and, you know, it's, yes. What would become the material continuity of the Novus Ordo versus the? Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, the the at least the, in the uh, the model of the thesis, you you you're going to look at some Novus Ordo bishop or or high clergy. Uh, converting, and that you would have a lineage that way through that. In other words, if you have somebody attached to the material side and he embraces the formal, in other words, he becomes a Catholic. <laughs> the the, uh, the uh, you've got everything. See, then then he, I would say, he could nominate somebody. That's the, it's got to somehow come from this, this body, though. You, you can't just trash that. 
and they're not ever going to do that anyway, that they know that this is their ticket to, to quote-unquote legitimacy. In other words, that they can present themselves as the Catholic Church because they are still doing that. And everybody goes along with it. That's why they've had tremendous success in inculcating the Novus Ordo. If they had said, we are a new church and we have new dogmas and, and you know, we are the liberal Catholic church or the modernist Catholic church, that would have flopped on its face. No one would have gone for that. Nobody. <laughs> That's what happened in, you know, after Vatican I. There was something, there's something called the liberal Catholic church that exists. It, it's something like the old Catholics. They have the traditional Latin Mass. I don't know if they even exist anymore, but there was something called the Liberal Catholic Church. It, it, and and Derlinger's uh, church, you know, it, it got a little bit of steam in Switzerland and Germany because Bismarck wanted to promote it as the Catholic Church, but that flopped. And then it flopped in, in uh, Switzerland. It, it has some existence in Europe now, in Utrecht, in, of course. Holland. <laughs> I'm glad we don't have any Dutch seminarians. <laughs> but they would have to recognize that their country has, has always been a, a home for all sorts of liberal ideas. It's true. Anyway, so that's, that's the... Uh, uh, so this is, this is why all of this is very important. So be that it be public both because the succession of visible pastors is public by its very nature and because hidden succession would provide no means of discerning a true church nor the true church nor a mark. So again, that precludes a seer. You see, I had a vision and, and uh, you know, truth, uh, Ingham is the new pope. <laughs> That would really be a problem. But the, in other words, that is not a visible succession. Don't get any ideas. See, that it never be never interrupted because if the line is interrupted, the old apostolic and divine line is not continued. A new one would have to be founded, but if it is new, it would be human. So if you're saying this is interrupted, you have to found a new church. Yes. Palmieri says that. He says that very thing that, that you know, if that's interrupted, whatever you come up with, and I think he even mentions that, you know, that the, it's a new church, it's not founded on the apostles. It's a new church. It could be a great church, <laughs> but it's not the real church. In other words, it could have the traditional Latin mass and all of the right dogmas and everything, but it's a new church. This, this has to go from St. Peter to the end of time. This must. It's absolute. The succession which we have here explained is considered immediate in those churches which, uh, which one of the apostles established. So the, the apostles established many churches, especially in what we call the Middle East or Turkey and what is now Turkey and Egypt. But almost, well, all of them have been overrun by Muslims. But you had, you know, Ephesus and Smyrna and uh, the the... The four um, this, uh, you had four major apostolic sees, and that was Alexandria, founded by Saint Mark. You had Jerusalem. These are the four patriarchates. Uh, you had um, Antioch. and you had Rome. Those are the four original patriarchates. 
And the Catholic Church, before you know, Vatican II, always assigned successors to those. They, they could not possess them, but they were legitimate successors in those sees. So you had somebody, in Monsignor so-and-so, or Bishop so-and-so, was the Patriarch of Alexandria, the Catholic Patriarch of Alexandria. See, so the only surviving see, apostolic see, is Rome. All other sees are apostolic in view of their, their erection as sees by Rome. So that's immediate. It is considered immediate if the church isn't a genuine offshoot of one of the churches founded by an apostle. And then, and then you know, since the Islam, that all has to come from Rome. The status questionis against the Protestants. The Protestants claim that their churches are, in a certain sense, apostolic. But we ask, in what sense are these churches apostolic? There are two responses. One, some Protestants say that the truth of doctrine must be preserved and that the pretext of succession is vain unless, unless the truth has been retained in an uncorrupted state. That's essentially the totalist idea. To, in England, the greater part of the established church and the Puseyites, though that's the high Anglicans and ritualists, they all, there's certain distinctions among them, but it's all the same. Do not deny that the succession of pastors pertains to apostolicity, but they err in as much as they do not consider the difference between material and formal succession. What is formal in succession is right and legitimate mission without which there can be no jurisdiction. Therefore, it must be proved whether or not Christ constituted that his church be apostolic in that manner, which we have described above, and that it be always numerically the same as that which existed under the apostles. So you can't have jurisdiction without Succession, legitimate succession. Thesis, the Church of Christ is apostolic. Argument one, apostolicity is that property of the church by which, through a legitimate public and never interrupted succession of pastors from the apostles, it continues in the identity of doctrine, sacraments, and government. So you have both lines there, material and formal. You have the succession from the apostles and continuity in the um, identity of doctrine, sacraments, and government. But Christ decreed that his church continue in such a manner, therefore the church of Christ is apostolic. Proof of the minor. The Protestants affirm with us the, necessi the necessary apostolic origin of the doctrine and the sacraments. St. Paul says, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. St. John says in the Apocalypse, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. B, an uninterrupted succession of pastors. The examples of the apostles demonstrate such a succession. Saints Paul and Barnabas are seen in the Acts of the Apostles to have established priests in each of the churches. Likewise, Saint Paul wrote to T Titus, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and shouldst ordain priests in every city, as I also appointed thee. So I can't get, get it any clearer than that. And so the series was continued. Two, there is no legitimate mission in the church if there is no legitimate succession. 
Therefore, legitimate succession is required for apostolicity. The consequent is obvious, proof of the antecedent. A legitimate mission is had either per se in each person or through a merely internal vocation or through a legitimate transmission from those who were legitimately sent to others who are to be sent. But that the first is obviously false is clear from the arguments by which we prove that a mission from God pertains to a sacred principality and not to all taken either separately or together. The second is refuted by the same arguments that and militates against the visibility of the church, that somehow you have been secretly selected, and gives rise to a great variety of sects, you know, which seer are you following, and not to an ordered church. Therefore, the third must be admitted, that is, the succession of pastors. We said uninterrupted because the mission which ceases to be cannot be continued. In other words, that once it dies, it dies. You can't raise it up again. Argument two, from the testimonies of the fathers, it is superfluous to adduce the ideas of the fathers concerning the apostolicity of doctrine and sacraments, which the Protestants do not deny. But what must be proven is the question of where the true doctrine and sacraments are found. This was solved by the fathers through the le legitimate succession of pastors. St. Irenaeus affirms that the doctrine of the apostles is proved by the succession of bishops. He speaks in this way, It is within the power of all, therefore, in every church who may wish to see the truth, to contemplate, mm, contemplate clearly the tradition of the apostles manifested throughout the whole world. And we are in a position to reckon up those who were, by the apostles, instituted bishops in the churches and to demonstrate the succession of these men to our own times. Those who neither taught nor knew of anything like what these heretics rave about. In another place he says, it is necessary that those who are in the church obey the priests, those who have succession from the apostles, as we have shown who, with the succession of the episcopacy, have received that certain charism of truth according to the good pleasure of the Father, those who stand apart from the princely succession, these fall from the truth. Okay, so that's, he's talking about where you have a, the, where these two things are together. <laughs> Our problem is that this has come, become detached from this. Which many authors, uh, if you read, you know, would say, oh, that, that, that would be impossible. It's possible. <laughs> this is an old saying in philosophy. If it exists, it's possible. But that's the problem. I think some say God could never permit a heretic pope because of the turmoil that would exist in the church as a result of a heretic pope. I've read that too. So that's why I say to, to find in books previous to, to our time a thorough explanation of this is impossible because no one... Uh, if you told this to anyone before the council, they they would just say you're completely out of your mind. This could not, such a thing could never happen. Tertullian, he's the one that became a Montanist, but he does have his his virtues in his early part, uh, you know, in his Catholic time in the work entitled Against the Prescriptions of the Heretics, showing that no claim of the heretics concerning the true church has merit, proposes very firmly the fact of succession. He establishes this principle, what Christ revealed to them, the apostles, and I here prescribe, must not be proved otherwise than through the same churches 
which the apostles themselves founded. Addressing the heretics, he says, let them produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops, running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that the first bishop of theirs, uh, uh, that, that first bishop of theirs, shall be able to show for his ordainer and predecessor some one of the apostles or of apostolic men, a man, moreover, who continued steadfast with the apostles. He, continue, he concludes against the heretics, Who are you? When and whence did you come? As you are none of mine, what have you to do with that which is mine? This, I say, is my property. I have long possessed it. I possessed it before you. I hold sure title deeds from the original owners themselves to whom the estate belonged. I am the heir of the apostles." Origen, who also became a heretic, some say, some say he didn't, but I, I think it's pretty sure that he did. He certainly fell into a material heresy. Let the ecclesiastical preaching be preserved through the order of succession handed down by the apostles. See that, and that was so up to 1958. <laughs> Uh, St. Cyprian confounds novation with these words, novation is not in the church, nor can he be reckoned as a bishop who, succeeding to no one and despising the evangelical and apostolic tradition, sprang from himself. For he who has not been ordained in the church can neither have nor hold to the church in any way. St. Optatus said against the Donatists, bring yourselves back to the origin of your see, you who would like to claim for yourselves the Holy Church. St. Augustine said, From where did Do Donatus come? From what ground did he spring? From what sea did he emerge? From what sky did he fall? He furthermore accuses the Manichaeans of contradicting the authority from the times of the apostles preserved and handed down to these times through certain successions. <laughs> All right, so that you can see that succession is extremely important with regard to the apostolicity. It's essential to the apostolicity of the church. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so. Objections. By no suitable argument is it proved that the entire revealed doctrine was handed down by the apostles to the churches. But if they did not hand down the whole doctrine, it is possible that some of the doctrines of the Christian faith, although they are true, nevertheless were not transferred by the apostles to the church. Therefore, apostolicity is not a mark of all the truth. Response. It is not proved that all the doctrines were handed down to each and every church. That means local churches. I concede to the churches taken collectively, I deny. The Holy Ghost taught the apostles all things. The apostles handed down the deposit of revealed truths to the universal church. But in what pertains to the Roman church, decorated by a special prerogative of faith, we will not here speak. Instance, in order that apostolicity of doctrine be perceived, a great amount of work and intelligence is required, but this is available only to a few. Therefore, apostolicity, since it is not obvious, cannot be a mark. In other words, you have to be a theologian and you know, spend your time in libraries to figure it out. Response, this work and intelligence is necessary if you investigate the apostolicity of the faith through a certain succession of pastors, I deny. Through doctrine itself, I subdistinguish. If you inquire into each doctrine singly, I concede. If you inquire general, generally through the way of prescription, I deny. God teaches truth to men through the pastors of his church. From this it follows that it is necessary to discern a clear apostolic origin of the doctrine through the successions. So the, the doctrine 
must continue as well. Nor does this knowledge require a lot of work since we are dealing with a public fact from which the argument of prescription is drawn without much labor. The argument of prescription is that if, if it is a, a public fact and no one has denied that it's true, there is no, there is no uh, evidence of its non-truth, then it, it is true. So it, it happens in property. If, if someone occupies a property and nobody objects, it, it becomes yours by prescription. And all civil laws you know, have laws regarding prescription. <coughs> it's one of the arguments for the real presence is that the Greek Orthodox, although accusing Rome of inventing all sorts of things, never said you invented the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. So that's an argument of prescription. And it's quite provable. I mean, the consistency of the church is totally provable. You, you, you don't have any contradictions. Prove it. Until you get to Vatican II. <laughs> Instance, the doctrine of the church is either true or false. If it is true, then the succession of pastors is superfluous. If it is false, then the succession of pastors does not cure it. Therefore, the apostolicity of doctrine through the succession of pastors is not known. Response, the second part of the minor is conceded. <clears throat> I distinguish the first. Succession is superfluous in order that the doctrine be true. I concede. In order that it be known, I deny. So succession does not make the doctrine true, in other words that it makes it known. In the church, the marks exist not in order that the truth be made, but in order that it be known. The succession of pastors is constituted for this reason, to make the doctrine known. You see, that's their purpose. So, and then, so then we get into other things. Not that they make true doctrine, but that the true doctrine be known. That's the purpose of the hierarchy. Besides, just as the doctrine is derived from the apostles, so is the hierarchy commanded by God to teach all nations. Objection to the Roman, the Greek, and the Russian churches all claim to have apostolic succession. This is therefore not a mark proper to the true church. I distinguish the antecedent. Those churches claim material succession, let it pass. Formal, I subdistinguish with all merit. There was a footnote, by the way, up here. The author concedes that the succession of pastors does not cure a deviation from apostolic doctrine. Notice that. This is significant in the present situation since the argument of many against Sadovacantism is if he is in possession of legitimate apostolic succession, then he necessarily teaches apostolic doctrine. See, that, that's the the major premise, you might say, of, of, their, of their argument. The author is conceding that legitimate succession does not cure a deviation from doctrine. In other words, making a heretic your pope does not save apostolicity in the Catholic Church. Yes? The Roman, Greek, and the Russian churches, they have legitimate succession? They have uh, material, illegitimate material succession. That's what practically everybody says. So, but that, that's from above, yeah. So, uh, they claim material succession, let it pass. Formal, I subdistinguish with all merit, I deny. One with merit, I concede. There is no need in the investigation of the, of the legitimate succession of any church to traverse the series of all the churches coming down from the apostolic age. In false churches, there appears and will always appear a place, something like a bloody wound, at which they were cut off from the body of the church and cast off. <laughs> but there shines forth in the church a true priority. It smites, however, all schisms and heresies, according to what Tertullian says. Where was Marcion then, that shipmaster of Pontus, the zealous student of Stoicism, where, where, 
was Valentinus then the disciple of Platonism, for it is evident that those men lived not so long ago in the reign of Antoninus for the most part. Antoninus Pius, that's the middle of the second century. And that they at first were believers in the doctrine of the Catholic Church in the Church of Rome under the episcopate of the blessed Eleutherius until on account of their ever restless curiosity with which they even infected the brethren, they were more than once expelled. It's amazing that he himself could have become a heretic after saying these things. Where was Marcion? Or rather, where was Montanus? You can say the same thing. He became a Montanist. But he was a bit of a nut. Uh, he was uh, sort of an extremist. Extremist. People should not get married. That sort of Instance, a sea which, cut off by the Roman pontiff and previously considered schismatic. So to answer your question, he doesn't really answer it. Uh, and I, I did part of that in my uh, article on the thesis years ago, quoting all of the authors who speak about material succession. But it's, it's a illegitimate material succession in the sense that uh, they are cut off from the body. That's the, so, but there is a succession. Just like there's a succession of presidents or there's a you know, succession of you know, CEOs in a corporation. <laughs> there is a succession, but it is cut off from the body of the church. A sea which, cut off by the Roman pontiff and previously considered schismatic, becomes apostolic as soon as it becomes obedient to the Roman pontiff. But apostolicity, if it had been constituted by God in the church, could not be lost and acquired in this manner. Therefore, apostolicity is not a mark with which Christ distinguished his church. I distinguish the minor. Apostolicity cannot be lost or acquired with regard to the universal church, I concede. With regard to particular churches, I deny. The church was constituted by the apostles as one body. Partial churches, however, many, were joined to this one whole church, constituted one church. In other words, the, there, there was a, a constitution of one church and the particular churches were, you might say, branches of the one church. That's precisely the opposite of the Novus Ordo Ratzingerian. He says that the, the Church of Christ is the sum of all of the particular churches. In other words, that the particular churches came first, and then you have this, this thing that arises, like a flower or something like that, that blooms. That's the, the universal church. It's the other way around. The particular churches depend upon the authority of Peter to be particular churches. Otherwise, they're cut off. Spam. <laughs> Getting a lot of spam lately. Um, so, partial churches, that means particular churches, However, many were joined to this one whole church, constituted one church. That should be a... That should be just joined. Joined to this one whole church, constituted one church. It is necessary that all remain in this one body. If churches are cut off, if they cease to live with the body with which they once lived, then certainly they cannot be called apostolic churches or living members. Those particular churches were founded either by the apostles or by successors to the apostles. But their origin is from the one church. It is not the other way around. 
You don't have a universal church as the summation of all the particular churches. The branches are cut off, which the apostolic vine is not, in which the apostolic vine is not continued. That's why Ratzinger's ecclesiology is downright heretical, that these people who are cut off from the Roman pontiff can be particular churches, and that when they celebrate their liturgies, the, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of the creed is present. Quote, There is one road to the recuperation of apostolicity, to return to the unity of the body which was before, and to remain in it. The center, moreover, of, of unity is the Roman pontiff, but we will speak more about this later. Oh, it's still the the no. He didn't he didn't transfer the see. He just lived in Avignon. I mean, popes moved around a lot in the Middle Ages. They went to Germany and France and all of those places, you know. But he's still the bishop of Rome, even if he's living in Avignon. He just had to get out of Rome because of the crazy Roman populace. Well, these are finished as apostolic. In other words, they are originally apostolic, but they, it, they are no longer apostolic sees because they fell into heresy or apostasy or paganism. So any apostolicity, any claim to apostolicity, uh, this is the, the only originally apostolic see, Rome. That's disputed. Most say no. In other words, could uh, like Napoleon would have him make Paris the you know the 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 sea, and the uh, most say no because there seems to be as he is the head of the church because he is the bishop of Rome. He's not the bishop of Rome because he's the head of the church, because Rome is the primary see. Why is Rome the primary sea? It was the Sea of St. Peter. See, so it all goes back to that. Rome and St. Peter are intimately bound. So the primacy of the sea is bound up with the primacy of St. Peter. So how Paris <laughs> would become, would have its relationship to St. Peter is, is uh, now you could argue, well, he's the successor of St. Peter, so therefore he could change the sea. But most say no. You know, they, with the hypothesis, you know, suppose there were a nuclear bomb in <laughs> Rome. Uh, things like that. I don't really talk about nuclear bombs, but suppose Rome were totally destroyed by an earthquake or something. You know, it, it, uh... But the, many of them consider some of these hypotheses to be impossible because God would not permit it. And you know that that's not satisfying <laughs> in the present context. So they, they sort of write it off. Well, that's impossible. You know, so yes. Well, it depends on what you mean by Rome. If you mean the Pope, if that's what you mean by Rome, yes, in the sense that in order for him to be a true Pope, he must profess the faith, obviously. In that sense, that the Roman mob will always be Catholic, 
I, I think that's a stretch. I mean, uh, the, the, it depends on what you mean by Rome. Uh, so it, it, it's really to, you know, it, uh, I don't see how the profession of faith or the, uh, of the Roman mob is necessary for the, uh, the continuity of the church. I don't see it. Well, Rome, you know, again, as long as the faith is in the Roman hierarchy, you know, that, that would, it would, it would seem to me that that is the sense of it. You know, whether Giovanni Bacigalup, who runs the pizza <laughs> store in Rome, has the faith or not, really does not contribute to the continuity of the church or its apostolicity, you know? <laughs> you see, I don't, I don't see where the connection is. And Rome was not Catholic until when? You know, until Constantine. Even then it was not Catholic. It was mostly pagan. Even when Constantine... It didn't really become Catholic until Theodosius. So for almost 400 years, 350 years, it was pagan, mostly. So I, I really don't see it. <laughs> 